Good afternoon, everybody. Aaron Keller here on the Law and Crime Network as we continue to monitor the courtroom in the Solander case out of Las Vegas, Las Vegas, rather, Nevada. This is a case involving a parent who's facing 46 charges of child abuse, including child sexual abuse related to children that were under her care. Some were foster children, uh, some were adopted children. These counts relate to three children specifically, but 46 counts. This is a huge case for the prosecutor to try to put that much evidence into the record. And we know from covering other cases in Nevada that oftentimes prosecutors there are able to slice and dice incidents and take one incident and levy potentially unlimited number of charges depending on how many strikes, how many blows, how many individualized incidents of abuse can be divided up, uh, perhaps within one incident. If there's an incident where someone was struck two or three times, four times, five times, it's five separate charges in Nevada oftentimes. So not a surprise that there are 46 counts uh, in and of itself, but it does speak to the severity of the abuse that prosecutors allege these children face. One of our regular guests here at the Law and Crime Network is Yosha Gunasakara. She's here to talk about this case. Yosha, 46 counts. How do we wrap our heads around it? So as you mentioned, each count is a separate instance. So if there's some abuse that happens on one day and then it continues on to the next day, those could be separately charged. And depending on the abuse, it could even make up a different crime entirely. So here we have evidence that the children themselves are going to testify. The judge is not going to allow us to show that testimony when it picks up here this afternoon so uh, we may be discussing it but not showing it or even hearing it that's the critical piece they really are going to need those children to testify and hopefully corroborate one another to make this case because thus far we've had people who have observed things that look like they could have been signs of abuse we've had people to whom those children reported abuse but they really need some of these kids to say, yes, this is what happened to me. Yes, definitely. They need the children to really prove up these charges. And oftentimes in these type of cases, you don't see the perpetrator actually go to trial because the children or the victims of the abuse actually do not want to come forward. And in this case, to really have proof without, beyond a reasonable doubt, you need the children to testify. So a unique case in that respect. But keep in mind that the, the reason investigators even marched down this trail against this particular defendant and two previous co defendants who uh, the jury probably doesn't know this but they already pleaded out mm -hmm. okay so it would be this defendant's child uh, an older daughter mm -hmm. and husband they pleaded out they admitted something here um, but this particular defendant is still going to trial we know that the victims spoke out about this when they were sent away to a boarding school and that's how this whole chain started to come undone Yes, so what's critical here is that the accusations are coming later, um, then they're not contemporaneous. So that's going to be something that the defense is certainly going to seize upon here. And they're going to have to seize upon every little thing because once we hear these children testify, it's no doubt going to be emotional testimony and it's going to be hard for the defense to really overcome that and, and be able to poke holes in the prosecution's case. You know, I wish that we could listen to it just from a factual standpoint uh, without of course identifying the children we honor it when the courts don't want us to identify someone but in this case the judge has said no video no audio it's a little bit unique because a lot of times we're at least able to listen so here we're not going to know exactly what they say but we know what they've said to investigators in the past there are incidents where they say that they had been beaten with paint stirrers they were prevented from using more than a couple of sheets of toilet paper when they used the restroom they were forced to wear soiled clothing on their heads. Some of this is just bizarre. And it's even more bizarre when you couple it with the reality that this defendant wrote a book about child abduction, abduction or adoption, excuse me, child adoption, which you can still buy on Amazon if you so choose. Uh, clearly, since the charges came out, it has a very poor rating. But what's going on here? 
I mean, there is just such an irony. It's almost like a slap in the face for her to write this book. I actually looked it up on Amazon last night. Myself, it has a one-star rating, and it really shouldn't even be up there given the allegations here. But it, it's just it's such an ironic piece of evidence. This woman is parading herself as someone who, you know, takes in children and, and talks about abuse in the system when she is the one who's perpetrating, oh, allegedly perpetrating the abuse herself. So it's a really interesting element in this case. You know, sometimes when there's a case like this where the elements might be a little bit tricky to prove or a prosecutor isn't sure how a child is going to respond on the stand, a prosecutor might be cautious about bringing the charges forward. But in this case, the prosecutor's really charged forward with these 46 accusations. That would seem to me that they have some confidence in the ability of these children to testify, to be believed, and to testify with clarity. Certainly. And, and one of the things that every district attorney, every assistant district attorney is doing with their witnesses is prepping them. So they're going to the office of the district attorney. They're going through all the questions. They're making sure that this testimony is ironclad. And that's a common and totally acceptable practice that judges allow both for prosecutors and for defense attorneys when they bring their own case and bring their own witnesses. I know that there's an ethical line with prepping. And I was always taught that you can discuss the general nature of the testimony but not actually read the list of questions and try to coach as if it's scripted. Now, it might be perceived as a fine line, uh, but have you been taught the same distinction? I have been taught that you can definitely ask the questions themselves. The most important thing that needs to be remembered here is you can't tell anybody what to say. They have to tell their own truth. They have to speak as to their own experiences and own memories. And the testimony really has to come out in the way um, that the person remembers it. So, so there's a very uh, definite clear line in, in that sense. And when it comes to children witnesses, the prosecutors, the investigators, Child Protective Services, they've observed these children. They've made decisions and judgments about whether or not these individuals are credible. And it's a lot easier for a prosecutor to move forward when the prosecutor looks and says, you know, I think this person is going to make a great witness. I think this person will be believed. Exactly. But ultimately, it's it's going to be up to the jury of whether they want to believe these children's stories. And, and it's not going to just be the stories. It's going to be the corroboration that we see, you know, from secondhand, from people who have a who have observed the abuse after it's happened, from bruises or any kind of physical evidence that really serves to cor corroborate the testimony that is going to come out from those children. Yes, let's listen to some more previous testimony in this case, or let's take a look at some of the charges. We've got them up again, 46 charges. Let's read through them yet again. 31 counts of child abuse or neglect, three counts of assault with a deadly weapon, 10 counts of sexual assault against a child, two counts battery to commit sexual assault. Now, that runs a wide gamut of facts, and we've heard the prosecutors talk about some of them. This is just bizarre. It's, this is just bizarre. It's, some of it is going to overlap. Some of the counts are going to overlap, but there's going to be a lot of information to prove up all the counts. But remember, even if she isn't found guilty on each and every count, just being found guilty on some of them is going to be enough to put her away in jail for a long time. Yeah, let's continue our review of previous testimony in this case as we continue to monitor the situation in the courtroom. I want to listen to Jan Finnegan, who is one of the nannies who worked with these children. Let's talk a little bit about the bathroom, okay? Were the Solander children allowed to just go use the bathroom if they needed to use the bathroom? Who gave you that instruction? I am Ava. Okay. Um, what? And so Ava said they weren't allowed to go to the bathroom if they wanted to. No, because they couldn't use the downstairs bathroom. So you're not allowed to use the downstairs bathroom, and you couldn't go when you wanted to. So what's the routine? If someone had to go to the bathroom, what happened in the house? The routine was approximately maybe about 10 o'clock. If one of them had to go, she said, I'm sorry, I've got to go to the bathroom. I said, no problem. But we're not allowed to go by ourselves. So all four of us would go up two flights of stairs. And I know the first time I thought it was unusual, but go to the bathroom, I would suggest, you know, to the other girls, let's stand back and give her some privacy. They weren't allowed to shut the door when they went to the bathroom. 
They weren't allowed to shut the door. So where would these other kids be standing? They were standing by the banisters there, and they're laughing and joking with me because the camera was right watching me, and I didn't know if the camera had voice recording on it. There's nobody standing on the banisters here outside the master bedroom, and they're giggling and laughing at me, well, and they're telling me there the wireframe. Thesis. That's just Bumper. Yeah. Okay. This is continue. If there's more to add, if not, I can move on. Well, I just found this highly unusual. Uh, they said they're only allowed to use a certain amount of paper in the bathroom, and they weren't allowed to uh, shut the door. And I would ask them to stand back to give the other girls some privacy. You mentioned something about toilet paper. What was that about? They told me they weren't allowed to use two sheets of toilet paper. Have you ever heard that before? Never. <laughs> Never. There were other kids, though, living in that house, right? Yes. Uh, Autumn and Ivy. Right. What were the bathroom rules for those kids? There was no bathroom. They used the bathroom downstairs and they went to the bathroom when they wanted. Did they have to stand in a group on the upstairs bathroom like no. the Solander no. children? No. Okay. Did Janet or Dwight explain why the difference to you? No, not at all. No. Remember the first time you ever did laundry? at the Solander house? Yes. Tell us about that. I decided to do a load of maybe socks and children and something were just to be helpful, you know, a uh, week. And Ava said, well, you probably get in trouble. And I said, why? And she said, well, my dad inspects our panties. And I, I was just astonished or bewildered. A man expecting, inspecting children's panties. So in disbelief, I just thought, maybe she's making this up. But I did a, did a load of laundry. And when he came home, he asked me not to do any more laundry. He likes to see their underwear. Okay. Just. Let me ask you this. Did you ever want to see um, Autumn and Ivy's underwear? Okay. You just wanted to see the sole under case. Were you working there around Valentine's Day in 2013? Remember anything about that day in particular? <coughs> I do. Please, tell this jury. With Valentine's Day, I, I thought maybe, well, these children missed out because they would go to public schools. They missed out on all the usual stuff. So after um, I got the other child from the bus stop, I parked my car near the gate. And I uh, managed to get all the five children in my car. And I took them up to, I don't know where, but anyway, the closest dollar store. And I let the children pick out whatever they wanted and wish them happy Valentine's Day. And I had hoped that one of the parents would call their children some happy Valentine's Day, but none of that happened. And I wanted just to give the children a little joy for that day as much as I could, but that was, that was <clears throat> And um, did any of the kids say anything to Janet or Dwight about that? I believe the older one said something to Janet, yes. And what was the reaction? She, Janet called the next day, and I answered the phone that she spoke to me, and uh, initially, she was very nice to me and all this, and in my mind, I'm thinking there's something behind this. And she, she went on to tell me that her husband had flown to where he was in Ohio, apparently. That, no, she was in Ohio, but uh, wherever he was, he had flown to have dinner with her on Valentine's night, and she shared that with me, that she had a lovely day, her and her husband got together. And inside of me, I'm saying to this, what about these children? But, uh, so, the next day she called, and so after she I speak to Ava, she says, so sure, so I gave the phone to Ava. So Ava shared this with Janet, her mother. And her mother got really upset with her that I'd taken her to the store. And she called just to tell the daughter just to take the garbage can out at night. And I was just horrified, one of those big poly carts that she takes out at night. I could have taken that out. It was dark at night at 7 o'clock. And um, she ended up crying. And I just put my arm around her, and I just shook my head again. But there was no mention of anything about Valentine's Day to any one of the children. Yeah. Did they call on that day? Did Dwight or Janet call no. on that day? No. Um, you mentioned that sometimes uh, Janet's daughter would talk with Janet over Skype. Do you remember a time where Maya went up into an area where Danielle was on the phone with her mother? I do. Okay. Tell us about that. 
Um, when I first got there, the younger daughter was not there the first week. Apparently she was out of town somewhere, but she came back and she would spend most of her time in the room. And uh, I, I had been helping Maya that morning uh, two or three times with her home, uh, with her schoolwork. She got a little uh, frustrated. And she cried a little bit, and I said, be okay. But much to my, uh, I didn't know, everything was being watched on the camera from upstairs, and she was telling all this stuff to her mother. Well, then they pulled Amaya upstairs, and I went up there went into my bedroom to listen, and she slapped her in the face. And that night I called the husband, and I said, well, this, stuff, this kind of stuff can't go on. But instead of dealing with it, he just called his wife. And okay, let me they, stop you there. When you, when you got to see Amaya, did you see Amaya after she had left that When she room? came out of the room? Tell me what her face looked like. Her face was very red, and you could tell she had tears in her eyes, yes. The kids ever talked to you, the soul Ender kids ever mentioned anything about hot water? Yeah. Who, who told you about that? Well, all three mentioned little bits here and there, but initially when they mentioned some of the stuff was hard to believe. Okay, well let me, I'm going to stop you there. Tell me about these kids' demeanor when they're sharing this with you. They're telling me in fear that they're getting in trouble. Where are you guys? Do you remember where you did? We're upstairs. And they told me that the mother had poured boiling water, and I can't remember which child it was, but poured boiling water over their head and scalded their head. Do you ever remember a time where Amaya was like sick with like like a sinus infection or yes. something? What do you remember about that? Was that which week was that? Do you, do you it was the second week, and I got there on a Sunday night, and uh, I said, where's the Maya? Can we, can we just, I want to stop you right here. Let's just set the stage for a second. What what time of year is this? Um, this is the end of January, probably. Maybe it's, it's winter time. It's winter time, Okay, yes. please continue. Go ahead. So I got there Sunday night, and I said, the children, where, where's Amaya? And then he had said, well, he's running. Oh, and he said he had taken her to the emergency room at the weekend. She had sinuses. Well, where is she? She was outside in the cold. And it was bitterly cold out there that Sunday night, I remember. She's outside picking up dog poop, and she's white as a ghost. So I just put my arm around her, and I said, why didn't you come inside? I told her to quit what she was doing and brought her inside. Um, I want to turn your attention uh, now um, to uh, sleeping arrangements. Let's talk about the foster kids, Autumn and Ivy. Where did they sleep? They had a nice room. They had their own room. They had a winning a good TV and a, and a regular bed. A nice what do you mean by a regular bed? The regular bed that we all sleep in, like a regular twin bed with winning a poo sheets and a cover. So they have, they have like a duvet cover on it? Pardon? Like a comforter? Yes, yes. So they have sheets? Sheets, yes. Comforter? Pillows and, yes. And a normal twin size bed. So they had TV in there? They had a Winnie the Pooh TV. What other sort of things were in there? There was also a closet, obviously, with all the kids' clothes and stuff like that. Okay. Any decorations and wallpaper? Yes. What sort of decorations, if you remember? Honestly, don't remember, but I think they were Winnie, I think most of the stuff was Winnie the Pooh. Okay. And so did they each have their own bed? That I don't remember because it was a twin bed, and I don't remember where the. But you remember there at least being a bed. Well, of course, yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, tell me a little bit about where the Solander girls slept. Down the hall, there was a large room, and I guess it was a large bedroom. They slept in there, and to my astonishment, they all slept on little cots on the floor. How many of them had regular beds, like on an them. ivy? None of the children. Not one? Not one. These are the adopted children. Their own children. Their own children. Did not have regular beds. Not one bed. Well, let me ask you this. Was there even room in that room for a twin size bed? Oh, definitely. Or were there room for two? Yes, there was room. three. There was room. Were there room for bunk beds? Yes, but there was room for three individual twin beds. Yes. So instead, what did they sleep on? There was even room for dresses, but there was none there. So they had no dressers even in that room? No. What did they sleep on again? Cocks on the floor. Oh. How many um, How many comforters did they have? No. Well, I mean, let's take them one at a time. How many comforters did Amaya have? No. How many comforters did Ava have? None. How many comforters did Anastasia have? None. Did 
Dwight or Janet explain to you why they didn't have comforters, but no. the Autumn and Ivy did? No. Did Dwight or Janet offer you an explanation that maybe there was a medical diagnosis and part of the treatment plan was to not have a comforter on their beds? No. They just had a little thin blanket there. They had a thin blanket on their bed and a small pillow, and that was it. Did you notice any differences between the clothing or kind of the quality of clothing that Autumn and Ivy wore versus the Surlander kids? Yes. Tell us what the difference is that you noticed. Uh, my first day there, when I had to walk to the bus stop and the Surlander children went to, this is my first time, go get their coats and shoes. And it was just like, I shouldn't use this expression, it was to me, I felt like I was walking three urchins down the street. Little and I had to walk with a pair of cowboy boots, she didn't have any sneakers. And it's just, it was just horrifying for me. Did they fit those shoes? No. Or did you tell Dwight or? I did at the end of the first week, I told Dwight she needed a pair of shoes, you know, we'll go get some, she never got any. And, and, and let me just, maybe it's just I didn't hear you. Um, when, when did you notice this thing with shoes that didn't fit? How early into this? First I few noticed days, it the very few, first few days I was there. Yes. Very first few days. Yeah. So he tells you within the because very Because walking to the bus stop, and she's walking with her cowboy boot, or cowgirl boots, whatever, flip flop, flip flop, but you know these things don't. So let me ask you this. So you mentioned it to White kind of immediately as you noticed it? Yes, I did. And he tells you we're going to get her some Well, there's some this weekend. Okay. Yes. So that first weekend, Dwight comes home. Yes. And then did you show up the following Monday of week two? I did. Were, were there any new shoes in the house? No. Okay. Um, Dwight then goes away for a week or whatever, for five days. Yes. But he comes back for weekend number two, right? Um, that Monday of week three, did he have any new shoes? No. Okay. And then you leave by the end of the third week? Yes. Okay. Were there any morning chores? for the Solander girls when they get up in the morning before they started their work day at homeschooling? Yes, I used to wonder in the mornings why it took so long for the little one on stage to come downstairs. And then neighbor would say, well, she's doing her chore. And I said, she's only seven at the time. I think it was seven. And uh, I said, what did she have to do? She had to get a bucket of water with pine salt and go in there and clean the bathroom every morning. How many times did and, let me just stop you there for a second. How, how many times did Autumn have to do that chore? Not at all. How about Ivy? No, they didn't have any chores. Did Dwight or Janet explain why that child no, had to do that? Me, no, um, <clears throat> You mentioned those those beds that Autumn and Ivy had, those nice beds with the comforters and stuff. Um, was one of the chores for Autumn and Ivy to make their own beds? No. Did the beds get made? Yes. Well, who made the beds? Ava. Ava Ava's made Autumn and Ivy's beds. Ava's chore was to go make the, the beds of Autumn and Ivy. There was only one bed in there as far as I can remember. Why didn't Janet explain that at all? Nope. Let's talk about the times that you kind of would see white in the house. Okay, because I mean there were times that you guys would overlap a little bit, right? Yes. Okay. Um, would he ever give you an explanation about why these rules were in place very much? What would he say about that, if anything? There wasn't a lot said when he first came home one day. I approached him. Uh, oh, about the rules? Are you talking about the panties or about the rules? Why did Oh, please, just cover whatever rules you can remember. Well, he just told me the reason he, he about the panties that he expects their panties uh, to look for infections and stuff of that nature. How about the food stuff? Any explanation on that? He just said they had intestinal problems. Okay. Um, you ever see Dwight taking photographs of the kids, the Solander kids, when he'd be in the house? No, I didn't. Okay. After the first couple of days, were you concerned about the things you were seeing inside the house with respect yeah. to the soul ender homes? Definitely. Did, as, as the days and weeks continued, did your concern grow or did it lessen or did it stay the same? 
Oh no, we broke. Why you stay? I stay. I stayed mainly for the children's sake. I couldn't see children going through what they were going through. My heart ached for these children. They were brainwashed and nobody was helping them. You mentioned that one of the little girls wanted you to take them away. Is that right? They wanted to get my car and come home to Lockwood, and I knew I couldn't do that. Did it cross your mind, though? It did cross my mind. It even crossed my mind to go to the nearest police station, but they wouldn't have helped. And what were you worried about would happen if you picked up those girls and went to the police? What were you worried might happen? I could have been arrested. I had a child kidnapped for my own, so I know. I've gone for nine years. There's a point, though, that went that you leave at the end of about three weeks. Tell us about kind of what the breaking point is for. Why you leave? By then, well, I thought I could lay the children down. I'd, I'd had enough. And the 19-year-old, who's their older daughter, Danielle. Danielle. I had some issues with her. And, uh, you know, she kind of shut up this and shut up that. She was telling, oh, the, 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 I forgot, the Friday morning I'm leaving, Janet Solander called mm -hmm. to talk to me. It was about, I think, about 9, 9.30. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dwight was there at that time. I can't remember if he'd come home early the night before or what. But um, <coughs> she called to talk to me, and I think she was trying to get me to realize, she said, the girls are all uh, lying to you and not for me not to... Um, believe all their lies. She said how they've lied to everybody and all this they were telling me a bunch of lies and I'm manipulated by their lies. Let me let me I wanna stop you right there for a second. Okay. You 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 said you you have you were you mentioned you had a, a child. How many kids do you have? I have two sons. Okay. So in the course of raising your own kids, have you ever seen kind of taught a kid telling a lie just in your own kind well, of yeah, yeah, okay. Of course. okay, so forget about the stuff that Janet told you about. I just want you to focus on those three, five days, those five day weeks that you have, the three, five day weeks that you have. Did you see these kids, the Soul Ender girls, perpetually lying to you about everyday things in the house? Never. Are you sure? I am sure. Just Okay, I mean, because you've had experiences where you catch kids lying, right, in your own past, and they get your own kids or whatever. Okay, so you've had those experiences before. And you're saying in the three weeks that you were there, you didn't really see these kids lying to you on a regular basis. No, I did not. Some of the things they told me, you wanted to believe if they were not true. Okay. Right. And when you're saying things like the hot water and... Or the, the issues like I had to do with the food and... Is this really true? Okay. And as the week went on, I, I, it was so deplorable. It was just, yeah. Okay. So I didn't mean to cut you off. So you were, <clears throat> let's take you back to what you were saying. You were saying, Janet was telling you, well, you know, don't believe all their lies, da, 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 da. Please continue. She was, uh, and this is in the atrium as you first go in the house, and uh, she's telling me all this. Within the conversation, I said, I don't need to listen to all this. I, I've had enough. And the daughter was standing in the, uh, the door of the tomb, and she said, well, shut up. And I thought, I don't need to listen to this, you know? And the little three girls are standing there looking at me and listening to all this, and they're crying. And um, so it went on, and I said, I just can't listen to any more than this, and they're making excuses. Look, they're all telling a bunch of lies. And I said, I'm not going to listen to anything. I was standing there and shaking. I was literally shaking. And then I started to cry, and I said, I've got to leave And I I went out the door and I was tempted right then to go to a police station. I didn't know. I was shaking. I was afraid to drive even. I really was. I was afraid to drive. And, uh, oh, and I said to Dwight right before I left, I said, can I please give these children a hug before I leave? And he said, yes. And I, I went over to give this child a hug and I told him I'd be praying for them. And um, they were crying and she walked out the door. I will never forget it in my life. And, I wanted to take it with me. I could have gone into the office, and I know officers there, but what could they have done? And I was letting the children, and I let these children down. So you leave. I mean, Did you call CPS to tell them about the things that you saw? I can't remember when I called, but I called a few weeks later. Yes. And did you, did you describe the things that you've been kind of telling us about? 
do you get a call back from CPS? But do you hear from Dwight again? I did. Uh, how does he contact you? He sent me an email letter, and I also, uh, they sent me a letter from Janet, uh, a survey letter for defamation of character. You got a letter from Janet saying... Well, apparently I got a letter, unfortunately they couldn't find my apartment, apparently, okay. but I was, I had all kinds of TV stations contact me, and that's when they found out apparently I was there. But I got a letter in the mail, which I received later, to say she was suing me for defamation of character. Oh, so trying to sue you, or at least the letters that they were going right. to. Okay. Um, what do you remember Dwight saying in his letter, if anything? Well, most of the letter he said uh, explained why he uh, um, checked the girl's panties for, and all this, and he explained about the eating and their intestinal, intestinal orders and stuff like that. Most of the letter he was just very defensive in there about everything, but the one thing that got to me mostly, he never had put not one good thing to say about any three of the girls. And he said they did not, um, he said he'd never celebrated um, Valentine's Day, but yet I knew he went and had dinner with his wife Valentine's Day. Yes, and he put that in the letter that he wrote to me. Yeah. So Janet had told you before that Dwight literally came and visited her for Valentine's Day. Yes, yeah. And he told you, yes. I've never celebrated. Um, that's right. Um, I forgot about something and I want to go back. Good morning, Sylvia. Now, you interviewed to uh, respond to a job from the Craigslist posting. Okay. So, in response to that Craigslist posting, uh, well, let's start with this. At the time that she responded to the ad, you were not a professional man, right? No. Um, you were just responding to a Craigslist ad and you agreed to accept a position to be paid under the table cash. Right. And you were paid for that under uh, the yes. table cash. Um, you were paid 450 per week okay. for uh, the three weeks that you were there. Right. And, and you are involved in the direction of your services, right? Yes. Okay. Now, when you uh, met with the soul makers, they indicated to you that they needed a part-time nanny because Mrs. Solander had to be away in Ohio to help her daughter who just had a baby. Right. And Mr. Solander worked, so the children had to have a baby. Okay. Um, so he was gone directly. Mm -hmm. And you went to children's home school. Yes, yes. And so what of your duties would be to ensure that they were actually completing all of their homeschooling tasks? Right. <clears throat> and you did that. Yes. So Monday through Friday, the girls would begin their schoolwork approximately 9 or 9.30. Right. And they would continue until about uh, 2 or 2.30. Is that your memory? Okay. And then they would get a break. Right. And then everyone would go uh, take that break, either use the restroom or you could go and pick up the foster child right. from the school bus. Correct. Right. Okay. And um, part of their homeschooling was making sure that they did all of their assignments, right? Right. Okay. Now, your instructions for the week were given to you every Monday by Dwight. Yes. And in fact, he told you this is their uh, food schedule for the week. Yeah, but it didn't differ from the first week to the second. My question to you was the instructions came from Dwight as to what the children would eat for the week. Correct. And the instructions were also from Dwight as to what schoolwork needed to be completed. Yes, yeah. Okay. Those instructions did not come from Janet. No. In fact, you did not have contact with Janet um, on a daily basis for those three weeks. No. Um, and she didn't give you instructions as far as food or schoolwork for the no. weeks, for any of those three weeks. Right. Okay. Uh, and then you were also instructed that part of your duties for the homeschool included reading the children's homework. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. So you had to spend time that you guys doing that. Yes. So let's talk about the children's schedules for the days. There were a total of five children that you were charged with taking care of in this home. Is that a yes? 
Yes, I'm sorry. I acknowledge yes. that you nodded for the first time. Yes. No, that's fine. It's just this is a recorded proceeding, so sure. they don't see the nodding. So we had uh, five children, and three of them were the Solander girls. They're actual children. Yes. And their ages were varied from approximately seven through ten, or um, seven, nine, and eleven seven. at the time. Thank you. That's what I was referring to. Seven, nine, and eleven. Correct. So they were older children. They were able to dress themselves in the morning. Oh, of course. You didn't have to put clothes on them. No, I went looking and helping them find clothes. My question to you is, you didn't have to dress them. No, no, I didn't have to dress them. They could dress themselves. Right. They could feed themselves. Yes. Okay. They went and took showers by themselves. Yes. They didn't have to ask permission to go take showers in the mornings. No, they showered. No, that was just part of their morning routine. They, they would get up yeah. and they would shower. Yes. And then they would come downstairs for breakfast. Right. And then after breakfast, um, they would start their schoolwork. Right? After breakfast, yes. Now the other two children in the home were foster children. Right. And they were younger. They were, uh, one was uh, a kindergarten or first grade age, right? Right. And then the other one was to stay at home age. She was pre uh, preschool. Pre preschool. Right. Okay, so she would have been maybe four. Something like that. I don't remember. She was small. Yes. Okay, so that was a child that you had to take a little more initiative on and, and help her with right. more um, personal care tasks, right. like getting dressed in the morning. <coughs> Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm um, have to make sure and, and um, help her make sure that she had uh, her baths in the evenings. Right. Because the foster children were on a separate schedule, right? They were big separate schedules. Yes. Okay. Um, because one went to school during the day, right. and the other one was able to play right. um, because she couldn't participate in the homeschooling. Right. Just not age appropriate. Right. Okay. Um, so she would you know, play. There were other things for her to do. Um, sorry about that. And then um, in the evenings, that's when the foster children would take their baths. I guess, yes. You guys, you recall giving a statement in this case? They would take the shower in the evening, yes. Okay. They would take the showers in the evening. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about this, um, this disclosure that Amaya had a seizure. So the middle child was Amaya. Correct. And when you first took the job, you were informed she had a seizure. I was not informed she had a seizure. Okay. They, that's the child told me that. Okay. And I told me. All right. But you learned, as, um, you learned that as a result of taking care of her. And you actually had to give her, at least for the first week, the medication. seizure medication. Yes, I did. Yes. Okay. And that's something that came from the parents. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So Dwight instructed you to make sure that she had yes. a seizure medication. Yes. Or, and then as of many, you absolutely gave it to her. Okay. So... You were nanny for the a three week period from the end of January through roughly the middle of February of 2013, right? Yes. Okay, and Amaya had just had a seizure and been hospitalized the, the Christmas week of December of 2012. Objection, as soon as facts not in evidence. As my recollection, she can ask the question differently. That's the To your knowledge, Amaya was in the hospital uh, Christmas week in two, December of 2012 because of seizure. I didn't know which week in December she was in the hospital. I just knew it was before Christmas. Okay. So I had asked the children, did you have a nice Christmas? And when I said I was in the hospital, I had a seizure, and that's how I found out about the seizure. Okay. And you testified that the girls had uh, no toys. It was just very sad in the house. That's what you said. It was Lego stuff, coloring books and Lego, and the Lego belonged to the other children, the uh, Amaya and Ivy. Yes. Okay. Let me see if I get this correct. You testified that there were no toys in the house. There was nothing for the girls to do, correct? I said that earlier, but that's all there was, was the Lego and the coloring books. But other things there were actually toys. There were coloring books. Yes. There was, um, <coughs> you know, the, uh, there was a TV with Winnie the Pooh. Up in the, yes, up in the bedroom. Okay, and then there was a family room, right? Yes. And there was a big TV in the family room, right? It was. Okay. And you were in any only Monday through Friday, right? So you have no knowledge of what happened on the weekends in this house? I have a knowledge only from what the kids told me, yes. So you have no personal knowledge about what happened in that house on the weekends? No. Okay. Now you also testified that 
the girls had only one, or one of the, so many girls only had one book to read, and that was her break. Yes. Okay. But isn't it true that after all of the dinner time and the schoolwork was done, the kids would play together? Oh, the kids played together. Yeah, they played together. And I played with them, too. Okay. I used to teach the kids how to juggle with each other, and they had a lot of fun. Yes. Okay. So they weren't just sitting around or standing around in the kitchen for the entire period that you were uh, in the home for the three weeks. No, Ava helped me in the kitchen, in fact, yes. Okay. Uh, and Ava was the eldest, right? Yes. Okay. Now, you, uh, you shared with us your parent, right? Pardon? You shared with us your parent as well. Yes. Okay. Children have chores as part of being a member of a household, right? Of course. Okay. And part of that is making sure that they help with things like the dishes, right? Yes. And help with things like cleaning up after themselves in the bathroom, right? Right. Okay. And if there is a dog in the home, there are chores like making sure that there's turns to picking up the dog food, right? Right. But not in nice cold weather when the child is sick. Okay. We can get to that in a minute. But part of being a member of a household is having chores for the children, okay. right? Okay. So the children were not required to vacuum and clean and mop, mop and dust, right? Right. Okay. They weren't grading their own homework, right? No. They weren't tasked with taking um, Autumn to the bus stop on their own, right? No. They weren't um, taking the dog out or, or walking them or doing anything like that, right? Right. Okay. Now you talked about how the children never went outside to play in the backyard. They would direct your attention to the backyard. The backyard was full of rocks, right? No, there was grass there too because the dog would go out occasionally and there was dog food in the backyard. Okay, so the backyard was reserved for the dogs, right? Correct. Okay. And the Solanders lived in a gated community, right? They did. Okay. And in that gated community they lived um, in basically like a cul-de-sac, right? Yes. Okay. And one of the houses uh, was was vacant, right? It just wasn't used. The one near the end of the cul de sac, right? I don't, I don't remember a vacant house because okay. the only place I walked to the gate to take the child to school, I didn't go down that street. Okay, but there was a, a street with a cul de sac, right? I think so. I don't remember that because I would just come in and park my car, and so I don't remember how a cul de sac anywhere. Okay, well, you were only there for three weeks, to be fair. I don't remember a cul de sac. Okay. Uh, but you know that the children have bicycles, right? I do. Okay. Let's talk about these cameras. So you testified on direct that you've never seen anything like that. Are you familiar with nanny cams? Of course. Okay. Are nanny cams illegal? No, they're not illegal. Okay. And you're aware that Amaya had just had a seizure? Yes. In December? And Janet was not home for a period of three weeks when you were hanging it, right? Right. Okay. That's just my question. I'll ask another. Yeah. Okay. You have no knowledge about whether or not the cameras were working. Oh, I do. You don't have any knowledge about whether or not they were working because you didn't actually run the cameras, right? No, I did not run the cameras, no. Okay. You don't know if they were plugged in? They were plugged in because okay. they were in use. Yes. If they were plugged in, you don't have any personal knowledge about whether or not they were running all the time? No, I don't. You don't have any personal knowledge about whether they were recording anything? No. You don't have any personal knowledge about whether they had audio enabled either? I don't. You don't. You just visually saw that there were nanny cams in the home, two of them. I know more than that because the daughter used to communicate with I'm not mother. asking what the daughter told you. I'm Objection. I, I'd ask my witness to be allowed to finish her answer. She's, she's explaining how she has personal knowledge. Well, she's explaining hearsay. Well, you are not hearsay. Excuse me, ma'am. So that's sustained. Testimony in the Janet Solander case out of Las Vegas, Nevada, there from the nanny, Jen Finnegan. She's got this line that she repeated several times that the children were brainwashed. Yosha Gunasakara is an attorney here in New York City. She remains here along with us this afternoon on the Law and Crime Network. So the children were brainwashed. How does a prosecutor or a defense attorney take that statement and then argue around it in front of the jury? 
So it can be used in both ways. The prosecution is undoubtedly going to say these children were brainwashed to accept the abuse. They were told that this was normal. They were threatened to not tell other people. They were just supposed to accept this. So that's how the prosecution is going to use it. The defense is going to use it to really attack the reliability and the credibility of these children. If they're brainwashed, are they able to distinguish reality and fiction? Are they able to testify truthfully? So it's one of those things that you really can see both sides capitalizing on. You know, there's been some insinuation throughout this case leading up to it and buried in that testimony that maybe the state didn't jump into things as fast as it should. And then Annie said there, uh, you know, she called Child Protective Services, didn't get a call back from Child Protective Services, um, got some blowback from the husband of this particular defendant that uh, this witness was defaming him. So then this witness is afraid to come forward. So, I mean, at face value, it just sounds like a mess, but that sounds like witness intimidation, too. Yes, it's interesting with this nanny why why she came forward when she did. And again, that's something that can be capitalized by both sides. I mean, the prosecution is going to say she was scared. She didn't feel comfortable coming forward. She only had a very limited understanding of the abuse. And then the defense is going to, you know, then try to discredit her by saying, yes, she only had a limited understanding of the abuse. And that's the reason why she is not able to really speak truthfully about the reality of the situation. We had cross-examination there trying to say that this particular witness didn't have enough personal knowledge of what she was talking about, that she was filling in the blanks. You know, that's really critical cross-examination, too. You only want the witness to be testifying about what he or she saw or directly heard, okay, conversations she was a part of directly, okay, um, you know, to fill in that witness's side of it, mm -hmm. at least, not... I heard this, or this is what I think they did with the tip, or, you know, things like that. Um, but there's a line there, of course, that, you know, if she sent a tip and didn't get a response back, she can testify to that because she didn't get a call back. Yeah, the key here is she can only testify to what she has directly observed, but that can still be very helpful. In the case of the tip, obviously, that's something that she can testify to, but even the state of the house, um, the condition of the children, that is going to be very helpful in corroborating what the children will eventually testify. So she doesn't necessarily have to be a witness who has seen the abuse firsthand. She can still be very helpful to the prosecution's case. I want to dial all the way back now to the very beginning of this case and listen to some of the prosecutor's opening statements. The reason we're going to go all the way back to the beginning is because we can't bring you live to the courtroom in Las Vegas, Nevada, Clark County, just yet. The court has taken a break, and then at some point today, we're not getting a signal because the children, the victims, are going to be on the stand, and the judge has ordered us to neither stream video nor to stream audio so we can't even listen to it a lot of times when there are minor victims or victims of sexual assault or abuse uh, we're not allowed to show you pictures from the courtroom but we can carry sound in this case we've been asked to carry neither one so we of course will abide by that decision from the judge uh, and it means we're a bit in the dark as to exactly how those victims are going to testify and how they're going to be attacked if they are going to be attacked on cross-examination. So we'll go back to the beginning of the case right now to opening statements from the state. Prosecutors opening statements in the Janet Solander case out of Las Vegas, Nevada. This is a Clark County trial. Yosha Gunasakara is still here with us in New York City to talk about it. 46 counts of child abuse, including sexual abuse. That was a lengthy opening statement, but it seems the prosecutor probably just wanted to prime the jury for the lengthy indictment here. It was a very long opening statement. You usually see closing statements that are that length, but you're right. What she's trying to do is to preview the evidence and to say this is what everyone is going to speak to. These are the specific allegations. This is how serious this case is, and, and she accomplished that. This sounds like another case where Child Protective Services in Nevada is accused of dropping the ball here. Five reports, and it took a long time for an investigation to actually take traction. That's got to be frustrating. It is, and I, I think 
probably what happened here is these individuals, and, and that's what the prosecutor was saying, really present as perfect foster parents. They are well-to-do, they have jobs, they have fostered children before. Um, she even wrote a book about it. And so it's kind of this unsuspecting um, family that's really perpetrating this abuse. And so possibly that's one of the reasons that they kept passing over these uh, constant allegations. The reason we're listening to some of these old clips, folks, is because one of the children, one of the victims, the alleged victims, is on the witness stand as we speak in Clark County, Nevada. The first of the several victims is the one testifying right now, and the judge has ordered us to neither stream video and nor stream audio from the courtroom. So we are a bit in the dark here in the studio as to exactly what's being testified to, but if it matches what the opening statement suggests, we have a sense of what's going on because the prosecutor really lined this out. There was one victim with an eye injury, one victim reported being kicked down the stairs, one reported being intentionally burned, one reported uh, basically, ha or several of them reported having their food checked. You know, they weren't allowed to bring certain types of food even though apparently they were hungry because the defendant had spun up some story that it would cause a stomach ailment or aggravate a stomach ailment. So, you know, just subjecting these victims to a ridiculously harsh degree of examination, having their bags checked even by bus drivers to make sure that there's no allegedly offending food in the bags. The state laid this all out. And then the state said at the end of the openings, okay, look, when we went into the home, we found things that would back up some of what the kids said. The beds were set up the way that the kids said they would be set up. There were these buckets that the kids said were used as part of the abuse. There were gates, there were fans, all of these things were there. I suppose a defense attorney could turn around and say, well, I mean, homes have buckets, homes have fans, homes have gates. It doesn't necessarily corroborate the testimony. But when you have three kids, don't they potentially corroborate one another? Sure, they do to an extent. I mean, they're still children, and so their memories are going to be different from that of an adult. And so what the defense has to do here is to poke holes in, in all of their stories, but to do so in a way that is very careful. They have to be mindful that the allegations here are abuse of these children. So they don't want to seem like they're bullying um, these children. And that's truly an art that is, is very difficult for most defense attorneys because they, they want to vehemently you know, defend their client. But at the same time, some of the best strategies, especially in cross-examination of victims who have suffered a lot of abuse, is, is to be gentle. The first of the alleged victims is on cross-examination right now. I, I wish I could see how it was playing out. But part of me wonders if the questions are very soft-spoken, asking the person on the stand, you know, did you talk to your siblings about what happened? If the answer there is yes, then that gives some wiggle room to argue that maybe they were sharing things, maybe their memories were running away with one another, things like that. And, and it's, it's tough to try to say that up against the allegations, but it's really the only place I can think a defense attorney would go in this case. And even if they didn't talk to each other, they most likely saw the abuse that was inflicted on, on one another. I mean, you're seeing a lot of the abuse that is alleged in the opening statement is this kind of group abuse. Like they had to go to the bathroom together. So it's inevitable that they saw the abuse um, that happened to the other individuals. So that's where the defense attor attorney is really going to hone in on. What would be the goal of honing in on it? It would just to say that their their testimonies are, um, you know, are, are affected by the other testimony. You don't have, generally when you have witnesses to crimes, you don't want them to be able to compare their stories and to have the same story. But we're here in the unusual situation where all of these individuals are not only being abused allegedly, they're being abused at the same time. So the defense attorneys are, are gonna say, you know, this is all fabricated. They're working together to fabricate these stories. That could clearly backfire, but it's really the only place I think the defense could go in this case. What, what else are they going to do? I mean, physical evidence is physical evidence. Photographs are photographs. Okay. Um, CPS didn't go after the defendants right away. Maybe there's some wiggle room in that and saying that, well, they apparently didn't think this was credible, perhaps. 
and then finally took action begrudgingly, perhaps. Um, but it's hard to characterize a case like this from the defense standpoint, I would think. It's tough just based on the allegations themselves. But again, there was a delay in reporting. You have a nanny who's reporting some of the abuse, but she does it a lot later. And you really have to question if it really was that bad. Went these other individuals, including, you know, the reporting agencies themselves come forward um, if this really was abuse. And so the defense is going to spin this as these are just parents disciplining their children. And it might not be discipline that you or I would do, but it's discipline that these parents saw and it wasn't, it never crossed the line into into abuse. And and that's that's going to be tough, but but I think that that's where they're going to It would be go. tough considering the whole catheter issue. I mean, that, that doesn't sound like normal uh, discipline, but We'll have to wait and see. So just to update everybody on where things are going in the courtroom right now, the first child is on the witness stand. We're told that that child is being cross-examined right now. And that child has been on the witness stand for two hours thus far. That's why we have not brought you any testimony for that length of time live here on the Law and Crime Network. We were under the impression that perhaps we would be able to bring you back into the courtroom sometime uh, this evening and and shockingly that just happened uh, seconds ago so we have a witness we can show you now so again this is the janet solander case out of las vegas nevada time for questions from members of the jury nevada is one of the states that allows jurors to ask questions of witnesses and that's the process that we're watching go on right now the attorneys are up with the judge of course questions from members of the jury are subject to the standard objections. So if the question would, for instance, call for a hearsay response or something of that nature, then an attorney can object and the judge just simply doesn't ask the question. That's how it works. Yoshigana Kisera is still here with us and we're getting ready to wrap up, but uh, we heard from Child Protective Services and this witness talked about her experience witnessing some concerning behavior from the victims. Yes, she did. And again, you saw the defense trying to limit that uh, exposure that she had with the children. And it's interesting. It's what you saw as well with the nanny. You see the defense trying to say, yes, you only saw a very small part of this entire picture. And that's how they're trying to discredit her here. Uh, we're going to wrap up the broadcast here on the actual Law and Crime Network. But if you want to keep watching the trial, it's still going on. Those jury questions are going to be coming out any second. If you'd like to keep watching, go to lawandcrime.com, click on the live tab, and there you'll be able to watch the raw feed of the trial as it comes into us. We just will not be along for the ride here on the network with you. So, Yosha Gunakisera, great to see you again here on Law and Crime. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to wrap up the day with a reminder, as I always give everyone, that we are on the air live from at least 9 a.m., until at least 5 p.m. Monday through Friday with live coverage of trials around the country. We've got a big case in Wisconsin we're expecting to begin covering this coming week, so you'll want to stick around for that. It, it has to deal with Fitbit data, and does it point to a killer? We'll see you back here Monday at 9 a.m. Switch over to the raw feed if you'd like to keep watching the trial from Las Vegas.